Hi there, I'm Brian Goulet of GouletPens.com, and it's time for another Goulet Q&A. This is episode number 42, which is just crazy. I can't believe that it keeps on going. And I keep on getting tons and tons of questions. This is just awesome, guys. Um, and I'm amazed I keep getting as many questions, even though now it's at the point where I am getting more questions. That not only am I getting more questions than I can answer, but there are more questions that I can't answer or don't have time to answer than ones that I do. So I'm, I'm really sorry if you keep asking the same question over and over again and you just can't get it answered. You know, when I get these questions, I have to take a lot of things into consideration as far as what I can answer. I don't have like a strict criteria, but at this point I'm still selecting, like handpicking every single question myself, bullet pointing it out myself, taking all my own notes and just everything. Like it's really kind of, I'm very involved in laying out the, the Q&A. And I do, I do, um, you know, think through every single question ahead of time to make sure that I can give the best answer possible. So it takes me a couple hours to prepare for each Q&A. Even though it seems like I might just kind of be riffing and just going off it, I, I do think through every single thing as I am picking the questions. So if you've got a really like detailed question about some like pen troubleshooting issue and I don't feel like it's something that I can answer fully with the information I have or that it won't be relevant to most of the people that are watching, I'll kind of you know limit it in that way so, or put it off or if it's like asking about a product I don't know anything about and I would only be able to research lightly to be able to give you a broad answer you know I may not may or may not dive into that so I'm trying to give you like the most power packed like intentional content that I can for each question so you know I do apologize if I don't get to it it's really getting to the point where you know, there's just a lot, there's so many good questions I have. I literally have a backlog of like 60 questions from the last couple of weeks of the open forums that I haven't been able to get to. And I just keep getting more great questions every week. So keep on asking, just I promise you, eventually I may get to it. I promise I may get to it. I don't know what that means, but anyway, um, I've had a bunch of stuff going on in the last week. So I'll just recap for a couple minutes before I get into the questions. So We've been really busy here, really busy. I haven't posted a video all week because we've been so stinking busy. Um, we've got three new customer care folks that are going to be joining our team. So we're basically doubling the size of our customer care staff. So, you know, that's kind of crazy, but you know, we're getting ready for uh, the holiday season. We want, we have so many projects and things that we want to be doing. We want to be on live chat more on our site. And as all of this stuff takes time, um, we've had uh, a big effort to try to improve our customer service. You, you wouldn't think that maybe we would need to improve our customer service sometimes, but we really are trying to make an effort in that way. And it's just been very involved in doing the interviewing um, and all that. So, and now we've got training and stuff. So we actually kind of restructured a little bit and we moved, uh, Drew, who was our, our shipping manager, uh, which we're now calling our fulfillment manager, we moved him into the customer care manager role, which previously didn't exist. Rachel and I were kind of tag teaming and sharing over that, but our company is a size now where we really need someone dedicated to, you know, escalated issues and being able to help our the train our customer care team. So Drew's been with us for three years. He's he's our most tenured team member, and he's just fantastic. He's going to be great in that role. And then Adam, who was um, our official trainer in, in our warehouse area, um, he is now our fulfillment manager. And both of them have really kind of stepped up. Um, we've got a big focus on kind of bringing up leaders within our company so that we can, you know, take on bigger and better things as we grow. So a lot of excitement going on, a lot of training, a lot of new stuff. Uh, and so it's really exciting, but uh, it's all in an effort to improve upon what we've already been doing all along. Um, so that said, we got a bunch of new products that have come in too. Um, we got the Monteverde Red Tool Pen, which is an exclusive uh, in fountain pen form here at Goulet. Um, so we were not actually expecting this to come in uh, until probably a month or a month and a half from now, but it showed up early. It's kind of like a fire engine red, a little bit, little bit deeper than that maybe, but it's uh, you know the Monteverde Tool Fountain Pen, really kind of a cool thing. I've done a video on that already, uh, but you can see that uh, it's, a, it's a neat thing and uh, the red is exclusive to us for the time being. <clears throat> and then we also got the Platinum Nice pen in. Um, we had a pretty uh, decent interest in this pen. It's a, it's a demonstrator uh, Platinum 3776 Century with the slip and seal cap. And it's kind of cool that you can see how the slip and seal works in this pen. I do plan on doing a more comprehensive video just on this pen. Uh, I just have not had the time this week. Um, it's a different finish though. And it's, uh, it's gotten some mixed feedback around here, whether people actually like it or not. It's got kind of a matte finish, but it's got, it's fluted. So the flutes are actually polished and the, the finish on the, on the top here is matte. 
and then uh, it's got rose gold trim. So it's gonna write really nice, just like a 3776. Um, their nibs are fairly stiff, and they have a bit of feedback to them. They're not scratchy, but they just are not, not made to be completely smooth. That's kind of how Platinum does things. It's kind of more like writing with a graphite pencil, uh, but that's how they do things. And so um, really kind of neat, and it comes with a, um, a silver converter. So instead of the typical gold one. So I wish it was a rose gold converter, but you know, I can understand why they wouldn't be doing that. Um, but that's kind of neat and exciting that it just came in. We've also got a few new um, ink colors from Organic Studio. Uh, so you can check those out as well. Um, and then what else have we got? We've got some other things that have come in. Oh, the Noodlers Flex Nibs. So Noodlers is now finally offering their Flex Nib and eventually they will be offering their feed uh, for sale apart from the pen. So it's a $5 flex nib. We did not get nearly as many of them as we wanted. And as of the filming in this video, we have a couple left. By the time this video posts, I guarantee they're gonna be gone. So we will be getting more in, uh, but for the time being, they're going to be limited. Uh, and hopefully they will get more. But I never thought that these things would be offered anyway because I know Nathan was against it for the longest time. So uh, I'm really happy that he's doing that. I know a lot of people are really happy that he's offering that as an option. Um, but uh, we haven't gotten the feeds yet, so this will be for the Ahab and the Conrad. Um, uh, but when we get those in, that'll be pretty exciting. Um, and what else have we got? Uh, the Schaefer has come out with a Schaefer 100 and the Ferrari. So it's got the Ferrari finial and then it's uh, got this kind of rubber. Uh, it's like a Ferrari tire, like rubber tire kind of thing. So it's like this rubber with, I don't know, it's kind of neat. Um, so the body of the pen is rubber. Um, that, that's uh, actually been a little more popular than I even thought it would be. So that's cool. And then we got a bunch of new Leuchtturm and Crown Mill products as well. So a lot of new stuff going on here. We've been pretty, pretty swamped, but uh, for this week's q and I got a bunch of questions lined up. I don't know if I'll be able to get through all of the ones that I'd planned. I had 17 planned, but we'll see how it goes. Okay, Joseph Q on Facebook said, what is the purpose of a music nib? Oh, yes, and that's actually a good point because I forgot to mention the Platinum 3776 now is coming with a music nib on the Chartres Blue and the Bourgogne pens. It previously was only available on the Black Century. So that's cool that that's an option now. Okay. Joseph Q is asking, what's the purpose of a music nib? Um, so you're not the only one to ask me about that. I've gotten several other questions about music nibs. Um, I think a lot of the reason that the music nib conversation is coming up right now is because um, the Noodlers and the Ponset with the music nib is out, you know, in people's awareness. Um, Stephen Brown just posted a video on it. Um, Alex, who, I don't know your last name, but Alex who won the Noodlers art contest and got a Naponset as a prize for that contest actually sent that pen to Stephen Brown to review and I believe they're gonna be giving it away on Fountain Pen Geeks at some point uh, a couple months from now. So that's pretty cool and exciting. So we actually got to see how one of these pens writes and everything. So thank you Stephen for, for making that happen. I haven't even seen the pen myself yet in person. I remember when we first started carrying Noodler's products uh, three and a half years ago, that Nathan was telling us about this pen. So this pen has literally been in the works for at least three and a half years. I wanna say he's gone through 50 or 60 different prototypes to come out with this nib. So his nib is a music, music flexible nib, <clears throat> which is kind of different than anything I've ever seen. Most music nibs though are not flexible. They're essentially just a, an italic nib with instead of one slit with two tines on the nib, it has two slits with three tines. So it allows for increased ink flow. So it's a very wet writing, very smooth flowing stub nib. Basically, that's what's going on. Um, that's that's what the like the true music nibs. Now there are other music nibs like Sailor's got a music nib on their 1911. I've got one of those. It's essentially just a stub nib. I don't really know why they call it music. Um, but uh, uh, the, essentially the point of the music nib originally was when you're writing music, um, you have you know the stems on your you know notations and then you have the, um, oh gosh, it's been, been a long time since I've studied music like that, but the little, the little fat parts. Gosh, I feel like an idiot. I should have studied stuff ahead of time. Anyway, I, I actually am a musician, but I haven't, haven't notated any of that stuff in a really long time. But anyway, the notes themselves, you have kind of a broad stroke and then the lines you do, uh, the stems you do um, a thinner stroke. So it's, it's a basically a stub nib. So when you go on the down stroke, it's gonna be fat. And when you go on the cross stroke, it's gonna be thinner. So it's, uh, that's kind of the point of it. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, that's just, it's, it's kind of a glorified stub nib, really broad stub, that's about it. All right, 
Rob B and Tim K on Facebook both said, have you folks at the Goulet Pen Company thought about designing your own pen? Um, yeah, I mean, of course. We've done some things like, um, you know, gotten exclusives and stuff like like the, the Monteverde thing. We've done, we did Nighthawk last year. We've done several collaborative pens like the Premiere with Edison um, and the Encore, which is now discontinued, but that was another one that we've done. Um, so that's definitely something we're, we are already been doing and will be doing in the future for sure. Um, but as far as like having a Goulet branded pen, like nothing else has ever seen. It's got our brand completely and all that. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely that's gonna be in our future at some point. Um, there's a lot to happen in order to make that a possibility. Um, and I would have to really think about like what I would want to do in order to make that happen. Um, but yeah, I don't know exactly when, but I could definitely see that being in our future. Um, as far as like whether we would manufacture it here ourselves in Ashland, Virginia, that is probably less of a possibility just because originally when I, I started out making pens in the pen world, that's how I got into this whole pen thing. And then when I discovered fountain pens, I actually looked up to Brian Gray with Edison as an example of kind of like a track I could go down because I was making pens by hand and I was like, okay, that's not working. So I could either go more of the, you know, craftsmanship route, get some, you know, more me mechanized equipment and stuff and get into making it like Brian Gray does. But then I'm essentially like behind the curve. I had to have to learn all that machining equipment and machine stuff is not necessarily my forte. And I was like, oh man, I don't know if I want to try and just like be in Brian's shadow and then try and beat him out somehow. Uh, but I, I noticed there was a, a huge gap in the retailing world. So that's the route I ended up going. It's always been in the back of my mind, like would I ever get back into making pens? You know, definitely not making pens like by hand, like when I first started out, but you know, sure, I could definitely see having some sort of design manufacturing in some capacity. Uh, in my future. I definitely like I'm very hands on. I think think like that. I'm, I've always really been into like as a kid, I was into Legos and connects and stuff like that. Like I had the connects roller coaster and I would literally spend like 10 hours on a Saturday, like building it and then breaking it down. You know, I just love doing that kind of stuff. So I could definitely see doing something like that in the future. As far as like where would we made who we'd partner with? I don't know exactly, but I'm exploring possibilities for that in the future. I wouldn't say it's going to be anytime soon, but Sure, it's definitely a possibility. All right, Scott R on Facebook. Are there any rules of thumb about relative nib sizes? Like do certain manufacturers consistently run larger or smaller? Do nibs from say Germany or Japan tend to be wider or narrower than the same size nibs from elsewhere? Yeah, so I think it's pretty well understood that Japanese nibs tend to be ground finer than European ones. Mainly all the European ones come from Germany. Um, but uh, and then there's a bunch of pens where you don't kind of don't really know where they're made. Their nibs may come from Germany. They may not. They may come from Asia. It gets kind of questionable. You know, a lot of the a lot of the um, manufacturers use parts from different places all over the world. That's that's not uncommon for basically all products that are made these days for stuff to be made kind of an all over the place. Uh, but yeah, definitely like the reason that the Japanese are so distinctly different is because um, you basically have Sailor, Platinum, and Pilot that are all in Japan. And they actually manufacture all their own nibs. They grind them all, they do it all themselves in-house. And I guess their culture, they just, you know, because of the characters and stuff that they write, they need finer nibs. So they tend to grind their extra fine and fine nibs finer. Now their mediums and their broads tend to actually be more similar to the Europeans. So even though the extra fine and fine will be about a full size smaller than the European extra fine and fines. So for example, a Japanese fine would be more like a European extra fine. Um, and a Japanese extra fine would be more extra fine than basically anything you'd find from Europe. Uh, but uh, that's, that's really kind of a broad rule. The, the reason that we created the nib nook, if you go on gulaypens.com, you look at the nib nook tool, that is handwriting samples that I personally have done for every single pen and nib combination that we carry. All consistent with Rhodia 80 gram dot pad paper with Noodler's Black. And so I've done that consistently myself with every pen that we have. And the reason I've done that is so that you can get a picture of what every single nib looks like that we carry. So that really is the best tool to use. You can do drop downs and comparisons of all the different pens and you can see for yourself, gee, what does a Lamy Steel Fine look like compared to an Edison Extra Fine and so on. 
you're able to do that. So that is definitely the best tool to try it out. All right, <clears throat> write sixty nine. Or sorry, write ninety six D on Twitter. Could you imagine your life without the GPC? What do you think you'd be doing? Wow, it's hard to say because I started making pens in two thousand seven, and really kind of went full time with it in two thousand and eight. Um, and then in, in the business in its current form here, we did in 2009. So I've been, I've been doing the fountain pen thing now for five years. And it's actually kind of coming full circle. Well, not full circle, but it's, it's, uh, I'm reflecting on it now because the, the DC fountain pen show is coming up, not this weekend, but the following one. Um, and that is in 2009, that's the show where I kind of had an epiphany to get into fountain pens. So that show for me is always kind of, um, significant just personally because of that's that's really where things changed for me uh, for this business for a future <clears throat> so you know about five years now I've been doing it you know really like double triple full-time right <laughs> so I've been completely immersed in fountain pens for the last five years um, so it's it's hard for me to imagine what else I would even be doing I mean I always had a passion for woodworking that's originally what got me into pen making in the first place I don't know that I would have been able to make that into any kind of career. I, pr I probably would have pursued that at some point, getting into cabinet making or something like that. I definitely could have seen that happening. Um, it would have been tough because I'm not sure I would have been able to make it happen quick enough because we had our son when I was 25. So that would have been tough to really build up a craftsman type career because you know, craftsmen don't make a whole lot of money. Um, not that it's all about the money, but you know what I mean. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Rachel was working at Capital One at the time when we first started this business. So, and then when Joseph was born, she was planning on going back and I was going to be a stay at home dad. And this was like three, four months after we'd started this business uh, with, uh, with the fountain pen stuff. And so I, gosh, I had intended to just kind of work the business and just run it out of the house. And then Rachel was going to be kind of the breadwinner going and doing her, her corporate thing. Um, but no, she just decided she couldn't go back. And so we had, we were sitting there in, two, in early 2010 with a mortgage and a three month old baby <clears throat> with uh, a little bit in our savings account and this little baby of a business here where we weren't even we weren't even drawing a paycheck like it wasn't we weren't even making enough money to even pay ourselves anything uh, at that time so to think like now we're, we're going to be at uh, 26 team members here at Goulet um, with the, the three we just hired so that's a little crazy definitely never thought we would hire anyone let alone 26 um, and so, uh, you know, we kind of just keep on doing that. So it's, it's, uh, it's just crazy to think of what else I'd be doing. I honestly don't know because before that I was, you know, making pens. Before that I was power washing houses with my dad. I was sealing decks to pay my way through college and doing handyman stuff. Like I've just had a very kind of eclectic uh, background. <laughs> so I'd probably still be searching. Like literally even um, before we got into the fountain pen thing, I was seriously considering becoming an electrician. I had looked into that and uh, I d decided pretty quickly that was not the right route for me because uh, as entrepreneurial and kind of um, self-pursuing that I am, I looked at like the National Electric Code and just all the regulation and unionized stuff that goes on in the electrical world. I was like, this probably isn't for me. <laughs> but I had actually applied with a company to become uh, an electrician's apprentice uh, before, before, you know, as I was making pens, um, but before it really uh, turned into anything. Uh, I was considering becoming an electrician. So I've always been kind of hands-on, uh, but uh, yeah, it's just it's hard to say where it would have ended up otherwise. Anyway, uh, next question. Henry on Ink Nouveau said, I know I can use sealing wax to create a wax image on the back of a letter, but what are the advantages of using sealing wax? And why should I, as a fountain pen user, consider using sealing wax? Well, you know, see, first off, it's cool. So like that right there is enough reason to use it. I'm just kidding. Uh, it's, I mean, it is pretty cool, but cool in like a nerdy kind of way, I guess. And I can say that comfortably because I love sealing wax and I like to use it whenever I can. 
So, uh, you know, I feel like I can, I can say that about, about myself. Uh, but anyway, so originally the purpose of sealing wax was actually as a security measure. You think like back in the day when you had like handwritten letters that were delivered by, you know, uh, people on horses and stuff like that. Um, it was a security measure. So basically you would, to make sure that you had a letter that wasn't forged, you'd have your own seal that would be like your family crest or something like that. Or you'd have like a ring. I know you see that a lot in the movies where you have like the king has a ring and like stamps the wax and all that. Um, well, that was fairly legit. So they had a brittle wax that they would use um, to seal the letter. So you'd actually, it wouldn't just be superficial. You'd pour the wax, like you'd fold the letter over and you pour the wax so that it would, it would actually adhere the letter closed. And then you'd put your signature ring or whatever, or, you know, um, seal into the wax so that whoever was receiving your letter knew that, that it came from you and that it hadn't been read or tampered with or forged because it hadn't been broken open. So that was the original point. Um, these days, it's really more just about the aesthetics. Um, and actually, because of the modern mailing system and all the automation that letters go through and stuff, if you put brittle wax on your letter and send it through the mail system, it won't even make it. You know, it's going to fall apart. It's going to break apart and be completely unrecognizable by the time it gets to your intended recipient. In fact, one time I, I received a letter from a customer who had sealed with a brittle wax and then put it inside another envelope so it would, you know, I guess protect it better or something like that. And when I received it, literally the entire seal was gone and all that was left was a fine powder of brittle wax. So I literally didn't even get to see what the seal was because it was just a disgust, disgusting powdery mess inside that letter. So do not send a brittle wax seal through the modern mail system. You don't want to do that. Um, they make supple wax, which is what we carry at Goulet Pens is the J. Urban supple wax. That stuff holds up really well. It's flexible. So if you put it on a letter, it will bend and flex and not break. Um, you want to be careful about how much you use. I mean, generally it's hard to use too much really, but if you're using a lot of it, it can actually change the weight of the letter if you're using a thick letter and then you put a wax seal on it, it can bump it up to weight. So you just have to be careful about how much postage you're putting on there. Um, but that's basically it. So these days it's pretty much just for the aesthetics. Steve B on Facebook, can I give my two year old a fountain pen and which is your recommendation? Are there any kids safe inks, washable and most importantly, non-toxic? Uh, well, I have a two year old and a four year old personally, and I would not give either of them a fountain pen. Uh, believe me, I'm all about fountain pens and promoting their use with, um, with bringing them up the next generation to learn how to write, uh, but it's too young, like honestly, in my opinion. I mean, I have a two-year-old and she will, you know, we'll have her fork at dinner time and she's waving it around, like nearly stabbing herself in the face with it and we're freaking out and then she screams when we try and take it away. You know, just two-year-olds just do not have the wherewithal, you know, to, to be able to use it. And aside from that fact, they just don't have the, the motor skills to be able to use a, a fountain pen. They would be like stabbing the paper with it and stuff like that. So it's really too young. Like, it's great that you're excited to do that, but, you know, hold off a little bit. Generally speaking, kids getting into fountain pens are more like seven or eight years old because at that point they have the patience and they have the dexterity to be able to write with a fountain pen. It does take a little bit of practice. So I would wait quite a bit before I get into it personally. Um, but you're asking about, you know, kid safe inks. <clears throat> it's, um, there's really nothing out there that's advertised as kid safe. I think in general, if you're marketing something as kid safe, it actually needs to be regulated by the government in order to have it as that designation. So you will not see any fountain pen as like non-toxic kid safe, more or less. Um, the only ink that I can ever think that I've seen that was kind of like a washable ink that was made for that kind of situation to remove stains and stuff, um, was, um, it's not around anymore, but Scribal Workshop had a washable ink that was um, for that, and they're not around anymore. Uh, but, uh, you know, basically fountain pen ink is water with chemicals in it and biocides and stuff to kill mold. So it's definitely not going to be non-toxic, pretty much in any form. Now, you could, if you wanted to, use like water and food coloring or something like that if you just wanted to do that. But you know, that, that gets debatable. If you're using like anything non-toxic, then you're pretty much inviting for natural growths to be able to happen in, in whatever you, your ink you're, you're using or making or whatever. So I would say just wait until the kid's old enough where the toxicity nature of it is not a concern. Not to say that like it's gonna be toxic on their fingers or anything, but you just don't want kids like ingesting it. That's really the issue. 
All right, Trisha C on Facebook, would it be possible to pay extra for fuller samples of ink? I don't wanna buy a whole bottle, but maybe five milliliters for twice the price. Well, I hear where you're coming from. I get asked this a lot, actually, but unfortunately, no, that is not something we're able to do. I know in your mind, it probably seems like not that big of a deal. Like, oh, you're already filling it. Why not just make it a little bit fuller and then you can sell it more? Okay, but think about the logistics of this. Like, we've got a pretty decent operation here at Goulet. Um, and though it's the ink sampling process is extremely proprietary, and I don't like to share exactly how it's done, but I will say that we're at the volume now where we are sampling up a whole bottle at a time. So, um, you know, it's not, uh, we have to, you know, sample them up, store them. You know, they do sell, you know, quick enough where it's definitely not a concern in terms of like the ink going bad or anything like that. So don't be concerned about that. Um, but if you think about it, okay, so a whole bottle of ink, you know, you get a decent number of samples out of that. Uh, but we have close to 600 colors right now. So think about how many samples you have times 600 colors. We literally have an entire wall in our warehouse that's about 30 feet long is where we store all of our ink samples. So, and that's in the two slight, it's at least two milliliters. It usually ends up being closer to two and a half milliliters that we end up doing. Um, if we were to double that and do something like five, that would be doubling all of the ink samples that we have. Okay, and not only that, but the cost and everything of the ink, like that's a lot of it, is the cost of the ink in the bottle, you know, for, for um, those more expensive, like Eroshizuku and stuff like that. Those ink bottles are really expensive. So I know it seems like it would be logical to just charge a little bit more and get more ink, but the logistics are just not making it possible. We're pretty much locked into a two milliliter. Um, and even still, it kind of, personally, it kind of defeats the purpose of what the sample was for. I know there's a lot of you out there who look at samples as a way to just get a color of ink where you want to use it every so often, but just not get a full bottle of it. And so you're using it more as just a small bottle as opposed to a sample. That's really not kind of the point of ink samples. Um, the reason we set up ink samples, and we set them up four years ago, uh, over four years ago, it was very early on we did that. It was because back then there were no swabs and there were no samples basically anywhere. I think like one company was doing samples and they're now defunct. Um, and so we kind of you know forged the path in that way and so the whole sampling thing especially like having a swab shop with samples was kind of revolutionary in the fountain pen world not to toot my own horn but we put thousands of hours of work into that whole process and so it was it was pretty and i'm not joking i'm not exaggerating by that either it was thousands of hours um into into setting all that up so it's been really involved and um the whole reason we set it up with the two milliliters, it was very intentional. Um, at the time, the other company that was selling samples was using glass vials. We chose to go with plastic because they were more economical and we could keep the cost down and give you more ink. Um, at the time, they were only selling one milliliter. So we went with two with a plastic vial to give you more ink. That was revolutionary at the time. And I know we've had some other competitors of ours that have started selling you know, more ink volume in there, but you know, there's challenges with that. We certainly consider doing that, but the problem is the more ink that you get into there, you have to raise the price because the ink costs what it costs. And if you start raising the price, then each ink sample, you know, it might be a little bit more, but when you're not sure about whether you're gonna like a color or not, if your ink sample then is gonna be $2 instead of $1.25, then $2 starts to get to the point where it's like, I don't know if I really wanna just try this color that I'm not so sure about for $2. Like, sure, it's great if I already know that I like the color, but I, don't want to buy a full bottle, sure, I'll pay $2. But if you're not sure at all about liking the color, $2 for each one of those samples, that really starts to push it um, for, for the less expensive ones. And then something like a Roshizuku would be more like $5. You know, you look at, oh man, a sample, a larger sample of Roshizuku for $5 versus like a whole bottle of PR or Noodlers or something for like eight or $12 you know, that really starts to, um, it starts to creep into really competing with an actual full bottle. So um, that was very um, intentional that we did it that way. And at this point, it's not something that we can really change. So um, I don't think you'll see us doing that anytime soon. I'm sorry. All right, Mary B said an email, you and Rachel manage a business and a family. 
and have all these delightful writing tools to play with. How much writing are you able to do other than product lit and video scripts if you script them? Well, it's definitely true that our time uh, is much more limited than it used to be. We have two children, anyone with two young children, our kids are two and a half and four and a half. They require a lot of effort and, and we want to spend as much time with them as we can in this extremely precious stage of life that they're in. Um, just the other day, Rachel and I, were, we, had, we had picked them up from preschool, um, which we had just put them into preschool about two months ago. and. Uh, even that was extremely hard because we'd, we'd run the business out of the house for a while and then as we moved the business out of the house, we were commuting with our kids, watching them at work. It just got to the point where the demands of our time and the, the effort and involvement and structure that they required was greater than what we could provide. So we put them in preschool. Um, that was a, one of the hardest decisions we ever had to make, but we're, we're glad we did it now. Uh, and they're, they're having a great time. They got all kinds of friends. They never had friends before. They've got friends now. It's, it's really great. We went to our first birthday party last weekend. Um, one of Joseph's uh, little classmates, uh, a girl, had a, a fourth birthday party. It was a Hello Kitty theme at Romp and Roll. Um, and uh, you might have seen Romp and Roll on Shark Tank a while ago, but that's a company that was started here in Richmond. So we went there and they were having a blast. Uh, and so it was really neat. So they have friends, which is cool. Um, but anyway, back to the point. So our time is much more limited than it used to be. And uh, even though that's the case, um, we still use pens a lot. Like any time that we're actually writing with anything, we're using fountain pens, um, except for rare circumstances where we need like a carbon copy check or something, something like that where um, it really makes more sense of a rollerball. Um, I don't use ballpoints, I just refuse to. But um, so when it comes to actually shooting videos and stuff, you know, I will, usually like to use the pens that I want to shoot in the videos ahead of time, um, just kind of naturally. So I'm a little more educated with them and kind of get to use them in natural form. So if we get a new product in or if we have a pen that we're considering carrying, I'll ink it up and use that as the pen that I carry around uh, as I write. That way I can kind of get a feel for it and understand it a little better. Um, but uh, the old school like full on pro like brand overview type videos that I did for, for pens and whatnot, um, I haven't done a lot of those lately just because they take so much time. Like it would take me probably about four to six hours to prepare for each one of those videos, um, which is, that's a lot of time. And you would never guess that, you know, to have an eight to 10 minute video that would take me four to six hours to prepare. Uh, so I started doing the quick looks. The quick looks have been good. Even those have been a little bit tougher for me to do just recently, given like all the hiring and stuff and the training and whatnot that we've been doing. Um, the product reviews and the videos and stuff are great and they are very important, but I've always got to balance that out with supporting my staff here and giving them the training so that they can service you directly like I, I want them to and like they want to be able to do and like you expect them to do. So there's always a balance there between how much time do I spend making videos, how much time do I spend helping our team. Um, and that's something I, I work really hard to do that. But um, I would say videos take me roughly about 30 times the amount of time to prepare for them as it ends up being in its finished format. So if you are seeing uh, a one and a half minutes or one or one and a half minute quick look video, uh, well, some of them have been a little bit longer, two minutes, three minutes, whatever. It usually takes me like one to two hours to prepare and record those videos. Um, between laying it all out. I'm not necessarily scripting it. The, the quick look ones are a little more scripted than everything else just because the more condensed something is, the more preparation it takes to do it. It might seem kind of counterintuitive, but for me to do a and a like this, it's an hour long, but it takes me like an hour or two to prepare because I'm just, I'm free talking. I'm, I'm referencing notes that I've already prepared, but I'm riffing a lot. For me to get everything compressed into a one or two minute video, I literally need to prepare for a couple of hours to say all of the things in the, with, with the, the, um, the in, intentional enough words to kind of fill all that space and everything that I wanna say in such a short period of time that it requires that much more preparation in order to have something that short. Um, so uh, yes, that kind of gets away from what you're originally Originally asking there, but you're asking about the scripting. So the video aside, you know, I definitely write with fountain pens exclusively. Uh, it's rare in circumstances where I won't use a fountain pen, um, but I, I definitely use it in every opportunity I possibly can. Um, so even if I'm not shooting videos or whatever, I'm still using it uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, like we had um, 
uh, some interviews that we were doing uh, this past week and last week. And so I'm taking all my notes in the interview with my, my pens. Um, and I, that actually kind of leads me into my, my next question here, um, which is from Jacob W. on Facebook. said, I know you tend to gush over the Pilot Custom 74 medium nib, which I love. So I got one as well. And let me say that it's everything you hyped it up to be. Yes. Uh, however, you never really talk about the Custom 823, although I hear people saying that it is the best pen in their collection. I was wondering if you liked it and if it was a noticeable improvement from the 74. Thanks. Um, well, yeah, I love the Custom 823. I have one of those as well. I've actually got it inked up in my laptop case right now. I was using it last week in tandem with my Custom 74. I inked them up with two different colors. I think I've got Dimey Majestic Blue in my Custom 74 right now, and I've got uh, Compeki in my Custom 823. So I don't talk about the 823 quite as much. I'm not as crazy about the amber color, personally. I would rather have a different color. If it was blue, it'd be perfect. But you know, a smoke or a clear, like I know they have those in Japan, they don't bring them into the US. So I'm not quite as crazy. I do like the amber with the yellow, yellow gold finish though. It does look really nice. Um, but that pen alone, I like that pen because it's got the vacuum fill, it's just cool, it, it writes really nicely, it writes very similarly to the Custom 74. The reason I think I talk about the Custom 74 more is because I had that pen first. It was one of, it was one of my first pens with a gold nib. I think it might have actually been the first pen personally that I had with a gold nib. So I used it a lot and I broke it in really nicely. So I've got a kind of a heavy hand when I write. So even though it's the medium nib, which is a little bit finer on that pen, um, because I wrote with it so much, it's really, really smooth. It's got a nice wet flow. I'm just, I'm very familiar with the pen and the way that it writes. So it's kind of like going home for me is that pen. And you know, the Custom 823 definitely would be the same way as I write with it more, but the Custom 74 is nice and broken in. It's, I, I got that pen a, a solid like two years before I got the Custom 823. So the Custom 823 is playing a little bit of catch up for me. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's still a phenomenal pen. But if you want the, that writing experience, but don't want to pay the Custom 823 price, because it is, it is quite a bit more, then the Custom 74 is a great alternative. I think that's why I tend to talk about it more, is, is that pen is a little bit more accessible to most people. But by all means, I love the A23. And I think that it is, you know, for those who invest in that, it, it, I could easily see that being their favorite pen in their collection. All right, Fred R on Facebook. Any news on the Twisby Eco? I have a Goulet gift card and that's what I'm holding out for. <laughs> cool, well, your gift card won't expire, so no problem there. Uh, you can hang on to it for as long as you want, um, but uh, the pen's been pushed out several times so far. The latest date we've been given is fall of 2014 or in, you know, near the end of 2014. So Twisby Eco, it's a $25 piston fill Twisby pen, steel nib. It should be pretty cool. Um, we've been hearing about it for a while, but you know, it, it takes a while to develop these products and Twisby's had um, you know, some delays, just like you know, pretty much every manufacturer that we work with has delays on new product releases at some point. So it's not anything super surprising, but unfortunately I don't have any more solid information for you than that, but uh, that's the best I've got for right now. <clears throat> Leslie H on Facebook. Okay, still would love to know, are all 1.1 stubs the same? And which do you and staff prefer? I have no complaints with my Lamy, but I'm having trouble on downstrokes with my Edison. Do you recommend Twisby, Goulet, or another brand? Okay, so um, they're not all the same, but they're all fairly familiar. I know one question, you didn't ask this specifically, but I get asked like, what's the difference between a stub and italic? Because some brands like Lamy will call it an italic, other brands like Monteverdi will call it a stub. They're all stubs, like no one sells a true italic, like a crisp italic. The difference between a stub and an italic is it has to do with the shape of the nib and the, the um, angle of the grind on the, on the tip of that nib. So um, for a, a true italic, you've got the point of the, the nib that comes up and then it's gonna be a very sharp grind. So it's gonna be a very sharp point on the ends of that stub nib or that italic nib. That's what's called a crisp italic. It's going to write like you're writing with a needle. Like it's gonna scratch the paper, it's gonna feel really terrible unless you write, unless you really know how to handle the pen. And most manufacturers are not going to even want to approach anything like that type of grind because I can guarantee you they would get all the pens returned because everybody would think that they're scratchy and aren't writing well. But that's just how they are. You know, when you've got a sharp point like that on the ends of that nib, it's gonna write, it's just gonna write scratchy. 
um, but it's going to give you very crisp lines. That's the reason people like crisp italics. So what they end up doing is they end up taking that crisp italic and they grind off the corners and round it out, and that's called a stub or a cursive italic. A stub is a little more drastic of a rounding out than a cursive italic, but you know, no one's going to advertise a cursive italic. It's always, they always call it stub. So it's going to write with the same or with a similar line variation that you would have with a crisp italic. It's not going to be quite as crisp, um, but it's going to give you a variation between the cross stroke and the down stroke, uh, but it's still going to feel smooth when you use it. So that's why everybody goes that route. Um, so yeah, your, your Lamy is one thing. Oh, hey, hey, honey. Five to 10 minutes. Five to 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, we'll do. All right, we've got some special guests coming here today that I need to wrap up in the next five to 10 minutes so that I can be prepared for them. So um, I will go ahead and uh, move on here. But uh, so <clears throat> no one really makes crisp italics. They're all pretty much stubs. They're all gonna be fairly similar. Um, it's interesting about the Edison one. I, um, you know, if you got it from us, reach out to us at support at gouletpens.com. We can help you out with that specifically. Um, try cleaning out the pen, you know, try using a different ink, see if any of that works. Um, oftentimes, especially with a stub, if it ever, if it ever doesn't feel right, um, uh, check the alignment of the nib. Um, especially with italics, it's easy for them to get thrown out of alignments, and especially if you're over-rotating the pen in your hand. Um, so try rotating the pen in your hand a little bit to see if it writes a little smoother, and then um, because it's not, it's not a perfectly round tip like it would be on a normal nib. It's going to be kind of flat. So you got to make sure that you've, you've got that flat part on the paper. If you have it over rotated, then you're not going to be making good contact with the paper and that can give you trouble. So um, it's kind of thing that's hard for me to assess in, in this kind of format right now, but try experimenting with rotating the pen in your hand a little bit. Try experimenting with the angle that you're holding the pen too, because that can also vary. Um, if you're holding it up too steep, that can make it hard, for, especially for those italic nibs or the stub nibs, um, to give you a good downstroke. Um, but, you know, worst case, you can reach out to us here, support We're happy to help you out. Or you can reach out to Brian Gray, Brian at EdisonPen.com. He's happy to help you out, and he's great too. Um, but uh, Edison uses Yovo nibs, same as Goulet, same as I believe most of Twisby's as well. So um, they may be like tweaked and stuff a little bit differently, but they're going to be made by the same manufacturer. So they're all going to be fairly similar. Um, and even those that aren't like Lamy and Pilot and other of those, they're, they're more or less going to be pretty similar. Kevin L. on Facebook, this might have to be my last question here. Um, is there a type of paper that your fountain pen should avoid at all costs due to dire consequences? Um, that, that sounds pretty drastic. I can't say that there's anything that I've ever used that I would like recommend that you stay away from at all costs. Um, no, there's really nothing that drastic. Um, newspaper tends to not do so great with fountain pen ink. Um, it not only is it thin and absorbent, but it can get like fibers and junk up in your pen. Um, so you just have to clean it out. You know, if you've got a really junky, really absorbent kind of fibrous paper, kind of the worst that's going to happen is you might get fibers that get jammed up in your nib and you just use a brass sheet to floss it out or you clean flush out your pen. And, that's about the worst that's going to happen. The only the only paper that I can think that might be an issue, kind of long term, um, would be um, what is it called, like rock paper or, something, or mineral paper or something. I don't know. Somebody in a Q and A a few weeks ago had I'd never even heard of it, but somebody brought you know asked me a question about it, and I had to look it up. It's basically a, a stone paper. That's what it's called. Um, so it's a paper that's made from like really fine ground up stone dust and some kind of like resin or something. It's, it's almost like a waterproof type paper. So it's, it's probably not gonna be like that ideal for fountain pens anyway, but because it's made from like a rock powder, it's, kind of, it's probably gonna end up grinding away that nib faster than like a wood pulp paper would. So that's probably the only thing that I would avoid using on a really regular basis. You know, writing on it every now and then is not gonna hurt anything, but that's probably something that I would, I would try to stay away from. Okay, well, shoot, I did not get all my questions answered. Only got 12 of them, but uh, I'm sorry for that. But, um, you know, I appreciate your time watching this week. Um, if you got questions for next week, I'm going to do another open forum. Um, gosh, it's hard to believe that it's, it's August already here. It's just crazy. This, this year is just flying by. But um, I'll do an open forum next week, so I'll have more questions that I will be able to answer some of them. <laughs> I apologize to everybody I didn't get to. I swear... I'm giving, the, I'm giving it the best shot I can. I need to do like two or three Q and A's a week at this point just to even keep up with the questions. But I don't know, maybe I could do that, I don't know. Uh, I like doing them on Fridays, but I don't know, maybe I could do more, who knows. 
Uh, if you've got any questions for me, you can leave me a comment on Ink Nouveau or on YouTube. You can always leave a question on Facebook when we ask for it um, early next week. You can hashtag GouletQA on Twitter or shoot me an email at GouletQA at GouletPens.com. So I thank you for spending time with me. I'm glad you're still liking this Q&A thing. I honestly never thought it would continue on this long. I thought it would keep it for a little while and then it would fizzle out and die, but it's picking up speed. So I'm glad that you still like it. Um, and that's, that's really great for me. I really enjoy doing them. So that's, that's awesome. I'll keep doing them forever at this point. So thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful week and right on. <laughs>